Welcome back to Nature League. If you watch this channel, you probably already know that I love sharks. Though, to be fair, half of my wardrobe has fins on it, so even a stranger would pick up on that pretty quickly. With this in mind, you can probably imagine my joy upon reading an online release of a brand new article in February 2019 all about great white sharks. Specifically, this study uncovered and looked at the great white shark's entire set of DNA for the first time ever. Having this information is almost like seeing a great white shark in full after only seeing a single fin or tooth. And as sharks have been around for so many millions of years, there are all kinds of things waiting in that genetic information that might help us learn more about ourselves and other species. It was like Christmas had come 10 months early and involved sharks. But what did this research team find hidden away in the genes of the great white shark? And what does it mean for other areas of research? To explore these questions and more, it's time for our Nature League segment called Denatured, where we break down a trending article from the peer-reviewed literature. For better or for worse, great white sharks are iconic. But despite their popularity in popular culture and media, very little is really known about their biology, and even less is known about their genetics. In this paper entitled, White Shark Genome Reveals Ancient Elasmobranch Adaptations Associated with Wound Healing and the Maintenance of Genome Stability, the research team characterized the great white shark genome for the first time and compared it to other species. But first, let's break down some of the terms in this article title. The phrase elasmobranch adaptations refers to adaptations specific to elasmobranchs. This is a group of fishes with cartilage throughout their skeletons, including sharks, rays, and skates. Elasmobranchs are some of the oldest vertebrates on Earth and have been around for more than 400 million years. So it's not a surprise that this group of species has super specialized adaptations that have allowed them to survive and thrive for so long. But what about the term genome? While a gene is a region of DNA that codes for something or serves some kind of function, a genome is an organism's entire set of DNA. And figuring out each piece of DNA throughout a genome is a process called genome sequencing. Sequencing a genome is no small feat. In fact, it wasn't until about 2003 that scientists sequenced the human genome, and that was with a ton of resources all committed to the project. With sharks, there isn't as much funding for genomic research as with some other more charismatic species. So if you ask me, it doesn't get more adorable than those steely black eyes and rows upon rows of teeth. Before this paper was published, only three other species of sharks had been sequenced for their entire genome. The whale shark, and more recently, the brown-banded bamboo shark and cloudy cat shark. But come on, I only know what those last two are because I'm obsessed with sharks. As for the great white, it's about time we sequence the most iconic fin around. But even without a full known genome in hand, there are some remarkable things about great whites and sharks in general that scientists have known for a while. For example, white sharks are massive, migrate across entire oceans, live longer than 70 years, can dive close to 1,000 meters deep, and even have the ability to regulate their own temperature. Sharks in general have some other cool tricks, like a keen sense of smell, a reportedly low incidence of documented cancers, and increased wound healing abilities. The thing is, even though we've observed these features, we have no idea how they've come to be and whether they have a genetic component until now. But first, a word. Not from our sponsors, but from the dictionary. If we're going to talk about great white sharks, we should investigate the species name first. The scientific name of the great white shark is Carcharodon carcarius, and these two words both come to us from Greek. Let's check out the genus first. That's the Carcharodon bit. The first part of Carcharodon comes from the Greek word karkaros, meaning jagged. This is also related to the Sanskrit word kara, which translates to rough or harsh. The don bit at the end of Carcharodon comes from the Greek word odon, which means tooth. Taken together, the genus Carcharodon literally means something like jagged tooth. The species bit of the scientific name is carcarius, which comes from the Greek karkaros. If that sounds familiar, it's because we already mentioned that word when we covered the genus. It means rough or jagged. So while Carcharodon carcarius is the scientific name of the great white shark, this name literally means something along the lines of rough tooth rough which, when our producer looked at this script, reminded him of what the first person who got attacked by a shark probably said out loud. Rough, tooth, rough, which, you know, 
isn't very poetic, but is definitely descriptive. To understand how the researchers went about sequencing the great white shark genome, I thought we might break down some of the methods. Specifically, let's work through exactly what it means to sequence a genome. In the case of this study, we'll be specifically referring to Illumina sequencing, which is sequencing by synthesis. And though there are several different versions and technologies out there, this is the one that these researchers used. First of all, you have to have some starting material. In this case, the team got DNA from white shark tissue and blood samples. So let's say this is the DNA that we extracted from that great white shark. The first step of genome sequencing is that we actually have to break the DNA up. And that's kind of weird because we're thinking, hey, we're trying to find the whole sequence but our computers and technology just can't deal with how much information that is. So for genome sequencing, at least now, the DNA has to be broken up first, then put all back together. Fair point, Lego block. Fair point. There is a process that very specifically breaks up all the DNA. So let's say that's happened, and we just have fragments of DNA. Then molecules called adapters are added onto the ends of all of those DNA fragments. Those adapters actually allow the DNA fragments to attach to something called a flow cell. The flow cell is a small piece of glass material that actually goes into the sequencing machine and has all of the DNA on it. Altogether, this step is referred to as library preparation. All of these fragments with adapters attached make up what's called a sequencing library. Once on the flow cell, these DNA fragments are actually replicated. And here's why. In real life, these DNA molecules are super, super small. And so in order for the sequencing machine to actually pick up signals from what's happening, it has to be making a bigger signal. When these all get replicated, they wind up having pretty much these little clusters that are actually clones of all this DNA. So one cluster will contain a ton of different replicates of identical DNA strands. And if you're wondering how all the clones were made and how each fragment was actually replicated, it's this really incredible process where it forms bridges and there's different molecules and enzymes that come in and build it and it's insane and very, very cool, but we kind of can't show it with these because Legos. Once all of these clonal clusters are created, sequencing can actually begin. Sequencing happens in a number of cycles. So I'm gonna show you what happens in a typical cycle and keep in mind that this will happen over and over until the entire stretch is complete. As a molecule, DNA is made up of a bunch of smaller molecules called nucleotides. Those are the actual pieces that make up the entire strand. So in this step of the process, synthetic nucleotides are introduced into the flow cell. They are able to find a place to bind because DNA has really specific rules about which nucleotides bind with which other nucleotides. In this hypothetical situation, we'll say that each one of these represents a different nucleotide. And when they're entered into the flow cell, they wind up binding to the nucleotide that they are able to pair with. For this kind of sequencing, what's really cool is that the nucleotides actually have a fluorescent dye attached to them. At this step, the electron Electrons in the fluorescent dye are excited by light, and so they're pretty much popping up signals that then the machine takes a picture of. The machine reads which signal was given off, and each of those signals are unique to the different nucleotides. So the machine is able to see, okay, that's an A, that's a T, that's a G, and that's a C. So even though in this kind of setup it looks like it's just a single nucleotide coming on, keep in mind that these clonal clusters have a ton of different copies. And so when the nucleotide comes in and binds, there's actually like thousands of them, and that allows the signal to be strong enough for the machine to pick up when it takes that picture. This is just a single cycle of this sequencing. What's gonna happen next is there's kind of like a reset, and because that first base was already sequenced, it starts over and then does the exact same process, but for the second base. Now that we're at that second position, we have enough signal, and a picture is taken and fed into the machine. The information from the photographs taken from the plate are translated into text files, and those text files are actually just a series of letters. Each one of the letters refers to which nucleotide was on these fragments. All of the sequences of the fragments are called reads, and now they have to somehow be put back together. Despite what it looks like here on the table, the sequencing process actually creates a ton of different reads. And because there's so much data, we actually have to use computer software to 
connect those reads together to form longer segments. All of those segments are continuous, and we call them contigs. Although these contigs are being assembled inside of the computer software, I thought I could show you kind of a physical representation of what's happening. We'll say that each one of these is a read that was generated from that sequencing step. Each one of the different colors is a different nucleotide. We have a ton of different reads, and so when the computer sees all these reads, it's trying to match up where they might overlap. So, for example, if you had three different reads, the computer would kind of be adjusting them until it found a long continuous segment. Then, this here would be a consensus segment. This contig can now be used in the next step of the process. Each one of these contigs is now organized and connected into larger pieces called scaffolds. Once that's happened, we're getting really close to having that full sequence. However, there will still be some kind of gaps in between, and the computer software works to fill those in to the best of its ability. And now, we wind up having a sequence of nucleotides that represents the genome, in this case, of a great white shark. While there are additional validation and gap filling steps involved, this is a very basic overview of this type of whole genome sequencing. Keep in mind that there isn't really a single sequence for a species. Only one individual is typically used, and they wind up as a representative genome sequence. There are also issues with poorly characterized stretches of DNA, errors in sequencing, and errors in the assembly steps. So it's better to consider this sequenced great white shark genome and those of most other species as a sort of hypothesis rather than concrete truth. So what did they find? Several interesting findings came from the sequencing of the white shark genome, and other patterns came to light when comparing this species to the genomes of other species. First, the basics. The great white shark genome contains 41 sets of chromosomes. Keep in mind that humans only have 23 pairs, so great whites have a significantly larger genome than us. Now onto the juicy details. Within the genome, the researchers looked for genes that appeared to be under positive selection. Positive selection is when a trait is beneficial to an organism, so is selected for over time. A gene under positive selection hangs around in the genome because it's beneficial in some way, and there are some methods that researchers can use to flag these regions of the genome. In the great white shark genome, about a third of genes that appeared to be under positive selection are likely involved in something called genome stability, specifically related to DNA damage response and DNA repair. It just so happens that genome instability is associated with things like aging and cancer, so this might support some of the cancer talk that surrounded sharks and and their relatives. And it's not only that these genes related to genome stability were under positive selection. The team actually found overall higher gene content related to genome stability. So overall, it seems like genome stability is a central part in the evolution of sharks and their relatives. In the white shark and other elasmobranch genomes, positive selection and increased gene content results were also seen in relation to wound healing. This included things like keratin proteins that provide protection against injury, and proteoglycans, which help to to regulate blood coagulation and the formation of new blood vessels. One surprising result had to do with genes related to smell or the lack thereof. Since sharks are thought to rely heavily on their sense of smell to locate prey, it would make sense that shark genomes would be full of olfactory receptor, or OR, genes involved in smelling. However, the team found way less OR genes than they expected, leading them to make some alternative hypotheses. Perhaps species like the great white shark just have a greater lack of these OR sequences. Or maybe there's a completely different group of genes regulating smell in white sharks. Or an enhanced sense of smell could be a result of scent receptors being overexpressed, instead of just having more of them. Overall, comparing the hot-off-the-press great white shark genome to closely related species revealed both genome stability and superb wound healing abilities as an integral piece of the evolution of sharks. In addition, a surprisingly low number of certain olfactory genes suggests a potentially alternative mechanism for their legendary sense of smell. Look, I know I'm biased and that sharks might not be everybody's thing, but we can probably all agree that there are some fascinating things about their genomes. The successful sequencing of the great white shark genome is one of many steps needed to fully understand these ancient beasts, and who knows what we might learn about ourselves along the way. Thanks for watching this episode of Nature League. To keep going on Life on Earth adventures with us every week, go to youtube.com slash natureleague, subscribe, and share. Hey guys, to celebrate the one year anniversary of Nature League, we made these really cool pens and they're for sale on DFTBA.com. So if you'd like your own and want to be a part of the Nature League, check out the link in the description. Thanks so much for supporting us.